Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This week, we are covering Nintendo Power issue number 35 for April of 1992. Last time, we had the ballot for the Nestor Awards, and this issue, theoretically, they are tabulating all the votes, so next time, we get to find out who won. Before I get too far into things, I do want to apologize for my lack of comprehensibility in my picks for last issue. Usually I try to do some in-depth analysis, but because of my copyright strike and having to split my episode into two 15-minute min- chunks, or approximately 15 minutes, that was the spot that I could most easily cut. I apologize. With that out of the way, I've got a lot of material to cover this issue, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is WWF Super WrestleMania, featuring Hulk, really freaking racist, Hogan, dropping the leg on Earthquake. I think from here, we're going to have less and less diorama covers and more photographic or art covers, as far as painted art, which I kind of think is a loss for the magazine. Well, in the letters column, you've been asked what you'll do for a Klondike bar. Now, here's the real question. What will you do for a SNES? That's the topic for the letters this issue. Probably my favorite letter is from a kid who would swim the Pacific Ocean, go over Angel Falls in a barrel, skydive from orbit, and also do his homework. That is someone who has comic timing. Sadly, our trend of movie release and Nintendo Power game publication synergy is lacking this issue, as we have Captain America and the Avengers from Data East this time, while we aren't getting another installment of the Marvel Cinematic Universe until next year. We do have the trailer for Avengers, or other Captain America, the Civil, Civil War coming out, or out as of this recording, It's not quite the same. The game has multiple routes you can take based on which adventure you select, Cap or Hawkeye. As you make your way through the game, you can find two other Avengers, the Vision and Iron Man as well, with the Wasp serving as your mission control as you make your way through the game. The article gives maps of the game's levels through New York, covering your first boss fight against the Wizard and your second with the Mandarin. However, this just opens up the second half of the game, with more boss fights against Crossbones, Ultron, and finally Red Skull himself. You know, Mandarin and Ultron on their own could make for a good game antagonist on their own right. Man, what is it with games that borrow the sort of non-linear gameplay style of Bionic Commando and just manage to screw it up? Thus is the case with Captain America and the Avengers. The game as you making your way across the U.S. as Hawkeye and Cap, originally separately, and then, once the two characters link up, you can swap between the two in each level. The problem is that the first few levels of the game are fairly monotonous. Indeed, Cap and Hawkeye's first levels are effectively identical, with only the difference of a single platform. Further, while the two characters play differently, their differences don't work quite as well. Cap deals more damage and can block some shots while with his shield, while Hawkeye's main thing is he can shoot in three directions, straight ahead, straight up, and at a 45-degree de- angle in which the character is facing. But what this means ultimately is Hawkeye takes more damage over time, when he's in action, because he deals less. Thus he has to be on screen with enemies longer in order to deal that damage. Now... If the enemies got stunned when they were hit, this would be less of an issue. Or if Hawkeye was able to shoot more shots than Cap could, this wouldn't be an issue. But instead, what happens is Hawkeye's, like, only really can have one arrow out at a time. One shot on screen at a time. Which means that an enemy can approach more quickly then Hawkeye can deal damage to them. Now, it takes about three arrow shots from Hawkeye to drop a a normal enemy, two or three, while for Cap's shield, it takes one hit, maybe two for harder enemies, maybe a little more, but the difference being is because of this setup and because enemies can't be stunlocked, we have a situation here where... When an enemy is approaching Hawkeye, you have to just keep shooting arrows at him and keep shooting arrows at them while they're getting ever closer, which means before you have a chance to take the enemy out, you have been hit. Whereas Cap, he hits the enemy with the shield, they go down, they don't get an opportunity to do damage to him. 
so he is getting hit less. Combine that with the shield, which lets you block additional damage, and basically, the game is heavily balanced in Cap's favor. There's no real equalization for Hawkeye to make him a more reasonable character in the game, aside from the 45-degree angle shot and the ability to shoot straight up. That's it. This game really had the potential to be a much better title, but it failed so spectacularly in some very basic gameplay balance elements. Either give this game a miss or play it with a game genius so you have unlimited health or something. Next up is the second town and country surf design game from LJN with Thrilla's Surfari. Rather than just being a collection of mini games, this game is a more conventional action game, sort of platformy, featuring TNC's mascot of Thrilla Gorilla, or one of their mascots. We have maps of the first two worlds of the game. Thrilla Safari is a game that I would describe as a clean-run game. A game which is frustrating and somewhat obnoxious to play as you try to learn the levels, but provides a certain degree of satisfaction what you once you figure out what you need to do to beat the level, at which point you go through the level in a clean run, without, getting hit, without necessarily getting any hits on you, because if you get hit, then you fail, and without getting hung up on obstacles or hitting obstacles, because, again, if you hit an obstacle, you fail. So, this is a style of gameplay that I'd describe as like what you see with some of the modern, quote-unquote, massacre platformers like Super Meat Boy or Super Dust Force, and some of the levels that you see made with Super Mario Maker. There is one significant difference, though. Those games have, effectively, unlimited lives. Thrill of Safari limits the number of lives available to the player. Honestly, this is a game where, were you to use an unlimited lives code with Game Genie or something else, this could actually be a lot more interesting and a lot more fun than as it exists right now. Because of this, with a Game Genie, or with a Retron 5 with cheats enabled, this could be a very fun game, and definitely something that's more fun from a single-player standpoint than the first TNC surf design. In fact, I could see this being a really fun game for speedrunners. Next up is Yoshi, a puzzle game for the NES where you have to sandwich Mario enemies between halves of a Yoshi egg. We have notes on managing enemies so you can better win. Yoshi is a fairly basic puzzle game. It controls fairly well, and it provides a decent amount of selection when it comes to controlling the pace of the game. You score points by either matching two enemies vertically, which removes both enemies from the board, or, as I mentioned before, sandwiching the enemies between the upper and lower halves of a Yoshi egg, at which point they collapse together and present a Yoshi on the board, and you get more points this way. This leads me to my real complaint of the game. With the matching enemies, it only can be done ver uh, vertically, not horizontally, which actually makes enemy management a little more difficult and a little trickier. While this does prevent some unintentional matches thus sabotaging your attempts to get the um, a sufficiently large egg, or sufficiently full egg. To put this in, in contrast, in Dr. Mario, you can match your colors on your pills and with the viruses vertically and horizontally. And being able to match enemies horizontally in that game, or do matches horizontally, allowed you to take what could potentially be an unwinnable situation and yank victory out of the jaws of defeat. It adds a whole other level of skill outside from, say, the random chance of the um, color of the next pill being dropped. Here, with the fact that you only have a limited number of slots that you can think things can be dropped down, and a limited amount of space, the skill-based nature of the gameplay is kind of reduced, because you're a lot more focused on the random number generator, on what types of enemies the game decides to spawn. I mean, yes, Tetris has the same thing going on, but there is a certain degree of skill and spatial recognition involved in Tetris in terms of recognizing what pieces go where. If you watch high-level Tetris play, and having done so, both by watching the uh, Summer Games Done Quick stream and watching Tetris tournaments at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, I see how the skill works to get how the skill can counteract the random chance uh, in Tetris due to the size of the grid, the size of the pieces, and 
all these other factors. With Yoshi on the NES, the, the scope of the board, effectively, in terms of the size of the enemies and the size of the board in terms of width of the lanes, makes a situation where random, the random number generator can screw you a lot more often. And it's a bit trickier from a skill standpoint to mitigate this. To mitigate being screwed by the random number generator. That said, if there was a version of this with horizontal matching, that'd be great. And I do like the concept of uh, managing falling enemies and also trying to sandwich them between two things to make a, uh, for lack of a better term, um, sandwich, a, a big sandwich of enemies or what have you. I could even see, like, I don't know, a Burger Time spinoff game. Um, basically doing the same sort of puzzle concept, and I'd actually be interested in playing that. But, as far as Yoshi goes, this game, it does kind of fall flat in more than a few respects. We have a whole bunch of codes and cheats in the classified information column, including one that gives you unlimited continues in Swordmaster. In the Legend of Zelda comic, Link's next goal is to go to the Tower of Hera in Death Mountain, before he is able to, at long last, obtain the Master Sword. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have Star Trek. This is a much more action-based game than the NES version, and I'd argue it doesn't tonally fit with the license as well. Also, I was not able to get this game to work, so a review is impossible. The cart does have a nice chiptune version of Alexander Courage's theme from the TV show, though. We next have a pair of combat flight simulators for the Game Boy. Turn and Burn from Absolute, and Top Gun from Konami. I feel bad doing this, particularly since I also ran into problems with Star Trek, but considering the problems I ran into last, ran into last issue due to length, and also considering that flight sims barely work on the NES, and the Game Boy has a much smaller screen resolution and screen size, and I believe the last flight sim I tried out on the Game Boy was utterly terrible. I'm just going to give these games a miss and recommend you do the same. If you're going to get a flight sim on a home console from the 90s, go with like, you know, the SNES. Moving on to something that will fit better with its presentation on the Game Boy screen, we have Ultra Golf from Konami but oddly enough, not from under their Ultra label. We don't have course maps in this article, but we do have a rundown of gameplay modes. Ultra Golf is a competently done golf game. It hits all the beats I expect with a golf game. Good course selection, three-click three -click power, power meter, the ability to, to sort of try to determine if you hook or slice by adjusting your stance when you swing, all of that. Like a lot of other early NES golf games, it also uses a top-down camera angle to show you where your ball is in relation to the rest of the course. Hitting the right shots, just a matter of making sure you're aiming in the right direction, hitting the right, hitting the buttons at the right time with your power meter, and, of course, well, having the right club selection. I do like that the game innovates by giving different clubs different profiles for their hot spot on the power meter based on the lie of the ball. A club that performs better on the fairway will have a smaller hotspot in the rough or in a hazard. The game only has three real problems. First, the top-down angle makes it a little tricky to figure out how to go about shooting around obstacles should you land too close to a tree. Second, the course feels kind of bland. It's not bad, and the holes we're presented with generally fit real-world golf course design but it just feels kind of generic. It's not like it's attached to any real-world golf course license or anything like that. Third, and probably the biggest complaint with the game, is that if you miss the hot spot, instead of going off course, where other games where you'll really veer to one side or the other based on where you miss your, your target, you just don't make any real contact with the ball. Again, it's not a bad game, it's just it feels... Well, like the next golf game to play once you've gotten bored with the last golf game or mastered that game's course. 
Next is Boggle Plus, an adaptation of the Parker Brothers board game for the Game Boy. I feel Boggle is hurt the most by the release of Wordtress, which is basically the same concept as Boggle, with the difference that Boggle has the license of a successful board game, while Wordtress was designed from the very beginning to be a video game. The presentation in Boggle is generally better, and I like the selection of various opponents with different skill levels to go up against, but it's still not really my cup of tea. We also have another arcade port with a Game Boy version of Missile Command. Missile Command is a fairly decent port of the arcade game, with a few graphical embellishments. Keeping in mind that I'm not playing the game on a Game Boy itself, moving the cursor around works well enough with the D-pad. The game does have a problem with the screen size, only allowing for two missile batteries and five cities, but they manage things enough where it's not any more difficult than the arcade version, it, nor is it easier than the arcade version. It The game doesn't really add any new gameplay modes to the arcade version. Sticking with what works, the only real major difference is the addition of a two-player mode to be played via link cable. The one big thing from the arcade version that didn't get ported over is the ending. In the arcade version, once all your cities are destroyed, you have a big glowing explosion that fills most of the screen before showing the words, THE END. Instead, we have a graphic of a ruined bridge with the same text, but which doesn't have the same impact. I mean, Missile Command's ending screen is meant to invoke nuclear annihilation, and this doesn't quite do that. In Super Mario Adventures, Princess Toad School escapes before her Bullet Bill wedding with King Koopa. We have an article this issue on Nintendo's planned CD-ROM add-on. Not the one with Sony that fell through, but not before Sony designed a prototype, but the other one. And the one planned with Philips after Nintendo kicked Sony to the curb with basically no notice, and which didn't actually lead to a prototype or any real solid hardware, just some god-awful games for the CDI. In Counselor's Corner, we get some questions about Final Fantasy II, particularly on how to beat the boss Ashura. We have another Adams Family game, this time for the Super Nintendo, but still from Ocean. We have some level maps and notes for the game, in particular routes to help let you expand your life meter before you rescue your captured family members. Once again, we have another game from Ocean, and as with the earlier NES Adam Family game, this one isn't particularly very fun. The controls aren't as loose as the NES version in terms of weird platforming, but it feels just as aimless, with no real direction in the game in terms of what places you need to go in what order. I mean, yeah, we got the guide, but a game shouldn't require you to have a strategy guide from Nintendo Power in order to beat unless it's bundled with that strategy guide from Nintendo Power in the first place. Further, the game gives you traversal power-ups, like a beanie that lets you do a double jump and glide somewhat, but those power-ups go away when you go into, through a door into one of the areas of the games uh, of, of the mansion. So, it's not like with Metroid, where you get certain power-ups which allow you to unlock certain areas of the map. So, this is, much as the NES game, not a very fun title, and definitely something to skip. Next is our cover game, WWF Super WrestleMania from LJN. We get a rundown of the game's roster. And is it wrong for me to say that I'm pleased to note that only three members of the game's ten-character roster are deceased as of this recording? WWF Super WrestleMania is a great step up from the earlier WWF WrestleMania games on the NES. However, it's not without its flaws. All the wrestlers pretty much have the same moves, and there are no sort of long-term campaign modes in the game. No race for the title in tag team mode, or single player cam um, one wrestler campaign mode, nothing like that. It's a more fun and more competent wrestling game than the NES titles from LJN were, but that's kind of damning with faint praise. We've previously covered Smash TV on the NES, and next up is Super Smash TV for the Super NES. So it's time to see how well this game works on this platform. 
we have maps of the layout for Studios 2 and 3. Now, this is a much better version. Using the face buttons works as a fairly reasonable substitute for the second analog stick. While the game does give a limited number of continues, which are considered to be a no-no with arcade ports, I will say that the game does give a considerably higher rate of extra lives than the arcade version does, which kind of compensates. Not totally, but it kind of does. This is a rock-solid 16-bit port of this game, and you, if you can't play this game on a platform with two sticks, like, for example, the version available through um, Midway Arcade Collections on the PS2, and I believe also either the Xbox, original Xbox, or the Xbox 360, or the PSN or XBLA releases of Smash TV, then this is a pretty good way to go. That said, if you have an existing way to play it on twin sticks, go with that one over this one. It'll be a much better and more fun experience and closer to the arcade version to a certain degree. But if it's not available and you've got a Super Nintendo or Retro Clone console, go with this one. This time in Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing the NES version of Adam's Family and Gomez warns him not to touch a switch in the kitchen stage so he doesn't disable a shortcut. In the now playing column, AD&D Pool of Radiance gets panned, but then again, because this genre isn't exactly their cup of tea, I suspect they prefer more narrative-focused JRPGs over Western-style dungeon crawlers. In the top 20, Metroid 2 has finally bumped Mario off the number one spot for the Game Boy. Our celebrity profile this issue is Eddie Furlong from Terminator 2 Judgment Day. The good news is Furlong is still working, including a four-year run on CSI New York. However, he's also been in and out of rehab and has had multiple domestic violence restraining orders, so this is not one of the best long-term careers of people who have made it into the celeb profile. In the pack watch, ooh, we got some big titles this issue. There's Street Fighter 2 coming from Capcom, there's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time from Konami, and a look at the release of Sim Earth for the Super Nintendo in Japan. My pick of the issue is definitely going to be Super Smash TV for the SNES. Super WrestleMania doesn't have much of a uh, single-player mode, and most of the other games I can't really recommend on their own terms without some sort of caveat. Aside from that, I checked Speed Demo's archive and did not see a No Warp record as yet set for Thrillist Safari. That is something I wouldn't mind seeing someone do. If you're planning your speed runs for the next oh, Awesome Games Done Quick or Summer Games Done Quick, that would be a cool thing that I would love to see. I might even chip in some few bucks during that one. I donated last uh, to Summer Games Done Quick. Just saying. So, until next time, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please l hit like on the video and subscribe to my channel for notifications of the next episode. If you really like me, well, there are a couple ways to financially support the show. There is the tip jar, which is over here. I'm pointing the right direction, really, I swear. Over kind of around here on the YouTube channel. And there also is the Patreon page, where you can send a few bucks every month, and you get your name in the credits, you can pick a, a topic for one of my other review show, for my review show, Breaking It All Down, and links can be found below. And also up here. If you're on my YouTube channel, that is. So, until next time, once again, thank you for watching, I'll see you then.